Um, yeah, so that I'll, I'll just make a few uh, opening comments. Uh, I'd say really the, the, the main reason I'm, I'm here is to talk about electric vehicles and uh, to do what I can to encourage uh, the other car makers to uh, accelerate their electric vehicle programs. I think the, the need for sustainable transport is incredibly high. Um, I mean, even in the face of uh, massively de declining oil prices, I think it actually becomes more urgent that, uh, that the auto manufacturers uh, transition to electric and put a, put a huge amount of effort behind their electric vehicle programs. Uh, as, uh, as you know, we've, uh, at Tesla, we've open sourced our patents, so we're trying to be as helpful as possible uh, for the advent of electric vehicles. Um, we've also said that our supercharger network, we're happy to have other car makers uh, use that supercharger network. Um, and um, we're really doing, doing everything we can to accelerate the advent of sustainable cars. Um, and so I think I, I'm hopeful that, you know, by coming here and maybe answering some questions, uh, I, I can explain why I think the opportunity for electric cars is tremendous and why I think that all transport, with the ironic exception of rockets, will go fully electric. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so it's really just a question of when it goes fully electric. And if we can make it go electric sooner, then that will be much better for the world. And, and we do have a significant danger with fracking technology, which is, I think, really still uh, at, a, at a, an early stage. Because uh, I, I think fracking probably increases the accessible um, oil and gas in the world by perhaps a factor of 10. I mean, we don't really know what, what the full extent of it is, but it's probably something like an order of magnitude, uh, which, which means the potential harm to the, to the climate is, is really much, much greater than it was before. Um, and, uh, and we can't rely on scarcity to drive the price of oil and gas high um, and, you, and have that be an adequate forcing function uh, to move electric. So we have to figure out how to make electric cars th themselves compelling um, without, without that uh, economic forcing function of high gas prices. Thank you. Very good. So Elon, welcome to the Motor City. Thank you. And thanks for being here. Just a couple of uh, Canadian boys talking fast cars and rockets. Could be better. If you were going to launch two businesses, I'm guessing the natural place to start would probably not be rockets and cars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think for sure, if you were to rank order companies to start and say, what is, the, uh, what is likely to succeed um, and what, you know, what, what has the best risk-adjusted return, pretty sure starting a car company and a rocket company would be at the bottom of the list. So, um, so why cars and why space? Uh, well, because in the case of cars, uh, it was very important for there to be a, an example of an electric car that, that was great. Like, there were no great electric cars. So people thought electric cars were like a golf cart, so they were slow and didn't maneuver well and had low range or ugly, didn't have much functionality. Um, and that's, that's the picture that people had in their minds. And we had to show people that an electric car could be fast, sexy, handle well, long range, and be a great car. And that's what we did with the Tesla Roadster. So it's really important to sort of just break the mold, to, break the mis to, to, to address that misperception that uh, one couldn't make a great electric car. And, and, then, uh, and then to show that if you made an electric car with all those attributes, that lots of people would buy it. Because even after we made the car, you know, a lot of people said, well, yeah, you've made this electric sports car, but nobody's going to buy it. And then there's something we had to show, yes, there is demand for it, and the same for the Model S. Um, and then with our Model 3 down the road, showing that it's possible to build a compelling, long-range, mass-market electric car. That's, um, I think that's, that's the, 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 the third uh, part of the strategy that I outlined with my first blog post about Tesla now almost 10 years ago. Um, so that, you, that's... Uh, you had a few people doubting you. I mean, when, when you go back just to... A few, just a few. Just yeah. a few people, right. Every, you know, here and there. <laughs> if we go back to 2008, you've had a couple of failed rocket launches. You've got a lot of Teslas sitting 
around in the garage. It's, it's, there are some issues there. In an instant, you receive funding from NASA, a huge contract from NASA for $1.5 billion. And then you also get funding for the car company. But you were at the bottom, correct? I mean, you were... Yeah, I think this is important to, to, to emphasize because when people look at, say, Tesla and SpaceX now, and they, think, they, they sort of think, well, maybe it was always... They were always in a healthy position. But, the, but it wasn't. No. At the beginning, we were in, in really dire straits. Um, no one would take us seriously, either the rocket company or the car company. Um, they, they just thought, well, he's sort of an eccentric rich guy and he's going to lose all his money. Um, you know, and they told me that several times. <laughs> um, I mean, the most common joke I heard was, you know, how do you make a small portion in, in the car, car business uh, or the rocket business? And the punchline is you start with a large one. Right. <laughs> Um, so I was like, I'd heard that joke so many times. I would just hit them with the punchline before they uh, had a chance to say it. Um, the, the, yeah, yeah, so it, and you nearly had a nervous breakdown. Around th- I mean, this, well, this was a personal... Well, I'm that, that close to a nervous breakdown. Okay. But, um, the, the, but I did think to myself, um, on the Sunday before Christmas in 2008, w- waking up on the Sunday morning thinking... I never thought I was, I, I was someone who was capable of having a nervous breakdown, but this is about as close as I've ever come. Because um, things were, so, were really so dire. Um, as you alluded to uh, earlier that year, after the first three rockets had failed, of our Falcon 1 vehicle. Uh, and, and I'd only really uh, allowed for enough money for three flights. So we had to desperately try to scrape together enough money for a fourth flight. Um, and, the, and then with Tesla, the financing round fell apart in the summer of 08 because the whole financial markets were crashing and GM and Chrysler were going bankrupt and nobody wanted to give us money. Not an ideal time to start a car company. Definitely not. Uh, I mean, try to raise money for a startup car company that's making electric cars to boot, which is like, <laughs> like that sounded like stupidity squared. Um, the, you know, investors would be angry that we even asked them, like, that, that, we, that we even asked them that would be angry about that. And, and in fact, the only way we were able to raise money to keep Tesla going was uh, from, uh, is that, that most of the existing investors uh, it agreed to, to fund the company, and I put all of all the money that I had remaining uh, into Tesla. So um, it still wasn't, it was, it was, you know, amounted to about, in total, about $40 million, 20 of which came from me. Um, and, then, and, now, and now I was tapped out. Uh, had to borrow money for rent after that. Um, and, and that tied us over <clears throat> into, uh, for about six, about six months, uh, to May of 2009 when um, Daimler invested in, in Tesla. Um, and, and that Daimler investment was really fundamental to, to the survival of, of Tesla. In fact, a lot of people think like somehow the government bailed us out or anything. That is actually not, not true. Um, it was the Daimler investment that saved Tesla, not, not, not government funding. Um, the, first, the first money we got from the government ever was in um, March of 2010, and that was after the crisis had passed. Um, and it wasn't your intention to even, that this would be profitable. I mean, you thought it was actually going to fail at some point, right? Well, when... Or you weren't sure it was going to be that successful? At the, at the start of Tesla, when it was just me and a few guys... Um, I thought, I thought we maybe had a 10% chance of success. Okay. How do you feel now? Uh, well, now I, th- I think we've got... Now, now I think this, some degree of success is assured, but it's a question of the magnitude. Um, so does Tesla, it, does Tesla become sort of a, a niche car maker making maybe... 100,000 cars a year or something like that, which was always super, super tiny, you know, that, that would be, um, yeah, I mean, 0.1% of market share. I think that's the definition of a niche if you're 0.1%. You have to at least get past the decimal right. point to not be a niche. You know? <laughs> um, so so that, that's one, that's one it's possible future. 100,000 or, yeah. or your stated goals of 500,000 by 2020. Yeah, I, th- I think we'll probably um, aim to do more cars than, than, than that. I'm not necessarily, by, by, by 2020, show the 500,000, but I think we'll probably continue past that. You'll continue past the 500,000? Yes. Okay, within, which time, within what kind of time frame? 
Um, let's say, I, I don't know, I think, I think we, should, we should be able to get to probably at least a few million cars in 10 years, a year. So by 2030? By tw well, by 2025. Oh, by 2025, okay. We, should probably, we can probably get to a few million cars a year. Um, we, we, we just, I think we're just going to keep driving our, our volume um, as, 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 as high as we can because our mission is fundamentally to uh, transition the world to electric cars. So if we don't make a lot of electric cars, then we're not doing as much as we can. Um, now, I mean, that, that, that being said, I think most of the good that Tesla will accomplish is by um, sort of cutting a path through the jungle to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to show uh, what can be done with electric cars. Like, so I think... So you think that, that the industry as a whole will adopt a greater... Yes, it, it, I think it, it's sort of... It's, the, the, big, the biggest impact that Tesla will have will be the degree to which we induce or, or, or cause other car companies to accelerate their plans for electric vehicles. Hmm. Um, Do you feel they have that kind of passion right now? Um, it, it's, it's a little bit. Not much, you know. It's, it's clearly not like, like not. It's not front and center. Yeah. Um, there were some vehicles shown at the Detroit show, for example, that are more in your um, segment than others. Yeah, I think that that's great. I hope to see a lot more of that. Um, but but until we start seeing serious numbers of electric vehicles, that it's hard to say that there's a ton of effort behind it. Yeah. Um, so I think we really. Um, Why is that? Well, I think for a lot of people in the auto industry, it's not clear uh, that the economics work for electric cars. Uh, I mean, it is a new, new technology architecture. Um, and usually in the car industry, things don't change that much technologically. Um, they, they're, I mean, the, the, relative to, say, consumer electronics, the pace of change is relatively slow. So. Um, I, think, I think for a lot of the car makers, they're not quite see, they're uncertain about the demand for electric cars, and you get sort of a chicken and egg problem. Like if you don't know whether there'll be high demand for electric cars, then you, then you don't want to make the investment to build them at scale, uh, and so then you don't know, you, you never find out what, what the demand is. I mean, there, there are certainly some exceptions like Nissan, um, and uh, it's not what, what GM announced earlier. Uh, so, I mean, that, that, that all sounds good, but compared to the 100 million new cars and trucks made every year, we're still talking very, very tiny numbers. So you're hoping that the industry really gets on board with the electrification plan and that within that sweep that Tesla then grows to these levels that, that you've just said. Do the economics work for you currently? The, the economics do work for us, um, yeah. The, I mean, I can't, I can't speak to our quarterly results at, before the quarterly results, but, um, you know, we... We have we've been able to achieve a gross margin in the mid to high 20s, um, so that that's a pretty good number, and um, you know, we, we are negative cash flow because we are investing a lot in uh, automation, uh, in the Model X product line, um, just basically sc scaling up our production, building out our sales and service infrastructure, building out the supercharger network, and um, yeah, developing uh, you know doing the final tooling for the Model X, doing some advanced work on the Model 3. So, so we're spending a lot of money, but if we were to just sort of scale back our growth um, and, and, and just go for mo moderate increases in, say, the Model S uh, customer base, uh, we would be profitable uh, by any measure, and I think decently so. Some say, I, I mean, the, the criticism out there is that every OEM adheres to gap accounting. Um, we do too. With a call-out for some non-recurring items, uh, but you leave out some costs that are permanent requirements of GAP, such as stock option expenses. So well, under they're, GAP... They're in there. Okay. Under GAP, do you make money then? Uh, we don't make money under GAP. We, we, we could make money under GAP uh, if, 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 we didn't, if we weren't growing at, and investing uh, huge amounts of money, we certainly would be GAP profitable. Yeah. Why not just release it the way everybody else releases it? Well, we, we do. We are required to release GAP financials. Okay. Uh, we, and we do. Okay. Um, when it comes to that kind of scale, when you mention those numbers and that, and that sort of scale, that's going to require enormous infrastructure, right? I mean, let's just look at, you know, the retail network as, as one point, you know, the service side of things. Sure. How do you get to those 
numbers with the current situation that you have now, and is, are you open to other retail possibilities? There's been a lot of talk of um, perhaps um, partnering up or, or at least forming your own, your own network um, that you'd consider adding franchise dealers to your distribution network when the volume gets high enough. How close would, are you to that? Well, I think what I've said is that there's no question we need to um, establish the initial foundation with our own stores. So that's what we're going to do in every part of the world, and we, we have been doing in every part of the world. Um, so so we, we, we think it's, it, before considering uh, taking on any, any franchise dealers, we, we first need to establish a solid base with our own stores um, and in, you know, in, in any given region. Um, so uh, once we've done that and, and we're able to catch up with our production uh, rate, because I mean, Tesla's just been production limited for the last, you know, well, since, since really the last, since we came up with the Model S, we've been production limited. So most of our focus is actually on production uh, gr growth um, as opposed to demand generation. Um, and when we more than, uh, in, in terms of our weekly rate, we, we doubled it year over year. It's pretty hard for a manufacturing company with a complex supply chain to grow by sure. you know, almost 100% in uh, annualized production. Um, so, so, so I think at some point we, we, you know, we'd, you know, we'd consider a fr franchise dealers, but, um, but we, we want to first establish just a few stores of our own. And, and, and we struck various you know, deals in places like, for example, in New York, um, city of New York, where we, uh, the, 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 the law now allows us to have up to five stores, um, and, uh, and then beyond that, we would have to go to franchise dealers. Um, we're okay with a compromise of that nature in other states, like Michigan, for example. Right. Um, I think that's a pretty fair compromise, and, um, you know, and, and then, that, then we, we feel secure at the stage of the company, because I, I, I don't want to be complacent about Tesla's success. And it is hard to sell electric cars. It's like it's a, it's a lot more effort to sell it than a, than a gasoline car. Cause there's a lot more education needed, um, and um, and I just feel we, we it's very important to have our destiny in our hands uh, at at the early stage. And then we can we can we can transition later if we can find the right partner. Because obviously we want the, we would only do this if uh, we were sure that a customer would have a really good experience. Um, and, you know, and there are, there are certainly lots of examples of companies that have a mixed uh, company-owned and franchise model, McDonald's being a key example. Right. The auto industry is a little different, though, in that, in that way. Yeah. Right. Are there... Well, well in, in the U.S., but, right. not, but in Europe, there's a mixture of company-owned and franchise. Sure, sure. But, but in the U.S., that's fine. obviously not the case. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there levels that you need to get to, or, or what are the levels that you would need to get to in order to consider a partnership? Have you set those numbers in your mind? It's hard to say exactly what the numbers are because we, we, we need to get our production rate uh, to uh, the point where we are demand limited, not production limited. So what would uh, that be? I don't know. It sort of depends on what the what, when we saturate demand. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, I, you know we're not, not currently at a point where we saturate demand, but you know it could be I don't know a few years or something. Um, but um, that's your estimation that it would be a few years. Yeah, before we consider such a thing. Um, and you'd want a partnership more than you would want. I mean, what would your preferred model be on the retail side? Well, I don't know what the preferred model would be. The, 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 the big thing I'd be concerned about is making sure that customers have an awesome experience, uh, and that they have a, that, that the, the sort of sales experience and the service experience is consistent and excellent. Um, so. So, you know, it would be, that, that, that's what we'd have to feel comfortable about. Um, and, and then obviously, you know, some of the car dealer groups have uh, been, you know, fairly negative in attacking Tesla. We're obviously not going to work with them. <laughs> okay. Just <laughs> <laughs> to be clear. Just to be clear. Right. <laughs> if you're being a jerk to us, we're not going to be like, turn around and try to do a partnership later. Right. That would be crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the factory storefront, you, you're still at an impasse in many states, and new challenges are cropping up all the time. And last year, there were a string of compromises and actually court wins for 
uh, Tesla. Do, do you need a national solution yeah, to yeah. allow direct sales? I mean, that's one of the possible outcomes, is a national solution. Are you pursuing anything within we're not, we're Congress yet, or federal courts? No, we're not yet pursuing anything federally. Um, although there was a petition, a White House petition, I don't know if you know that, but yeah. uh, that a petition, petition to allow Tesla to sell direct nationally, which got uh, you know, 120,000 signatures or something. Um, and we, we didn't create that at all, so it was just like basically up sort of Tesla fan base. Um, so, but, so right now, we're really just having interaction on a state-by-state -state level. I'll be in Texas uh, tomorrow. You've called that, I mean, it's kind of the hardest nut for you to crack here, right? Uh, and, Texas is a very important market for us, uh, for sure. And um, You lost in 13. Yes. What's going to be different this time? Well, I think in 13, we didn't have enough time to, to really talk to the key legislators. Um, and we actually did, we did pass in the House, uh, right. but the bill never made it to the Senate. Senate, right. Um, so I think that, that uh, I, th I think it's, it's mostly just about getting people comfortable, making sure there's a reasonable compromise here, and, um, and seeing what we can do. I do think, in the case of Texas particularly, direct sales is fundamental to the, the Texas ethos. I mean, Dell, Michael Dell, who started Dell right. Direct right. in Texas. Okay, so like clearly, <laughs> <laughs> clearly Texas is, is pro-direct. Um, and, 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 and so the, the, the prohibition against direct sales, I think, is, is antithetical to what Texas is about. It's un-Texan. Um, and, and so I think we've got a decent chance of figuring out some compromise legislation in Texas um, this year, uh, but, you know, feel feel fairly optimistic about that. And again, we're not looking for, you know, wholesale uh, repeal of like the dealer laws. We're just saying, like, look, let us have a few stores here, um, and and then we'll talk later. You want the same thing in Michigan, obviously. Yeah. Right. I don't think like anything we're asking for is like crazy or unreasonable or like going to take food from people's mouths or like we are a very tiny, you know, situation. So. Right. And even if we, if we got big, we'd still be like maybe a few percent of the market. So. But if you get big in the direct sales method, I mean, if you go to an Apple store and there's a hot product, there are lines that are out the door. If you get hot in the Tesla market, I don't think car, cus car consumers want lines out the door, correct? So it doesn't... True. Right. Yeah, people have come to expect that they can buy their car immediately. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose they don't want light lines out the door. <laughs> We don't have that many stores, you know. It's really a pretty small number. Let's get back to the business model. Do you need to start showing a profit? Uh, well, I, I think we we will at some point need to start showing a profit. When would that be? Um, when would that be? I guess probably when the Model Three is in full production. Which is when? Uh, 20, I mean, we feel pretty comfortable saying 2020, like at the, you know, so that, you know, getting to that half million. I, I think when we're doing half a million cars a year, we, 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 I think we should be profitable at that point. Or by 2020, or, with or half we're doing something million, wrong. Yeah, got to start making some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think there'll still be a lot of room for investing in future technology, but uh, at that point, we we should be at a reasonable scale where, despite investing in new technology, we, we're still profitable. So, just to be clear, you're still on track for the 500,000 by 2020? Yes. Okay. How many Model S's did you sell last year? Well, I can't say the number because I'd be front running the earnings call. Um, so, uh, but, you know, we're, we're pretty happy with the number of cars that we, that, that we, uh, that were produced and ordered. It, it, you know, with Tesla, the, the metrics are a bit different because in the normal car business, sales, and deliveries are the same, are the same thing. Like, right. like you know, because the, the, the cars go to the, the dealer lots and then they get sure. sold. But in, in the case of Tesla, and so, so that's a that's that's a real understanding of the demand level. In, in the case of Tesla, since most of our cars are ordered in advance, um, the, the the actual measure of demand is how many orders does Tesla have on the books, because they're built to order, right. um, and, and there's a typical waiting time of anywhere from one to four months. So. So, so you had so, said so, you wanted to sell 35,000 last year. That was, the, that was the goal. That was our aspiration, yeah. Did we come close? 
Uh, well, well it's, again, no, it's, it's... Or did you um, have enough order? Our aspiration was to deliver right. 35,000. We actually changed that to 33, yeah, because we, it was getting too difficult to get deliveries done over the end of the, you know, over the Christmas break and everything. Um, so, so our aspiration was to deliver 33,000 cars. Um, uh, we, we sold, in terms of orders for cars, far more than that. Okay. Um, and then, then, then there's a question of car, how, many, how many cars were manufactured, and then how many cars were delivered. So it's, those are the metrics that really are important. Uh, and, and we need to do a better job of educating the media um, so they don't conflate uh, gaps, like sales, meaning deliveries, with actual demand. Because they'll think, oh, deliveries went down, so that must mean people, fewer people wanted your car, uh, but actually, the reason deliveries went down is just that our manufacturing ramp was slower than we expected. Well, because you don't report monthly sales and delivery numbers, the investors and media kind of guess uh, at all kinds of crazy methods and put out all kinds of bad information. So every, every OEM reports sales by market. Why not release the number like any other car company? I, I think we probably will in the future, but um, I mean, I think once every three months and once every month is not, it's not a huge difference. Um, I'm not sure how that actually helps, really. You know, I mean, it helps if you're in the press and you could write three times as many articles instead of one. Okay. <laughs> see, you're educating the press today, so yeah. So I'm sure. Okay, that's. I can see how that helps if you're if you're a writer, but it's not like <laughs> just not clear how it's helping Tesla. Um, and and I think sometimes it's difficult to interpret these numbers uh, because we will make cars in, in batches, so we'll make cars like a you know, for. Three weeks, we'll just make cars for Asia, and then we'll switch to okay. cars for Europe, and then yep. we'll switch to cars for U.S., and then those will get delivered in waves. And then so, so people will see huge differences in deliveries from one month to the next um, and assume that, that somehow consumers had are, are going through these wild gyrations in their interest in the car. It's actually got nothing to do with that. It's just when the boat left. Okay, so that's all. Um, so I think right now... Releasing things on a monthly basis would just get people really confused. Um, are your U.S. sales rising? Or are your orders for U.S. cars rising? Yes. By how much? <laughs> no, I can't give that detail. All right. Um, I can ask. But I, I mean, I can't say that, um, you know, in the, it, it, uh, over the course of last year, uh, we saw a significant uh, increase in demand for North American, uh, a, a significant increase in North American demand. Uh, and a significant increase in demand in Europe. Um, things were a little uh, weaker in China, um, but just because I think of some communications issues that we need to fix, um, uh, most importantly around charging. People have a misperception that charging is difficult in China, but actually at this point we feel we've solved all of the charging issues. Um, but, uh, that, but we've got to work to correct that misperception. Um, so, so I'd say, um, so North America, uh, and Europe, excellent. Actually, Europe, Europe, surprisingly excellent. Um, and, um, and and then places like Hong Kong, actually really good. Australia, uh, good. Um, and um, but then China was was uh, sort of unexpectedly weak in the fourth quarter. It's, it's still we had more than enough demand to make up for the reduced demand in China, and we'll fix the China issues. I think uh, and and being in pretty good shape probably towards the middle of the year. The Model X is now over two years late. What went wrong? Well, I, I, I do have an issue with punctuality, I should admit. <laughs> <laughs> Not my... You were always that kid that was a little yes. late to class? It's just like, yeah, yeah exactly. It's true. <laughs> um, I'm like, um, I guess, you know, I'm sort of inherently optimistic, and I think sort of sometimes that optimism... Um, leads to me thinking it can get, get, get done sooner than it can. So I'm, try, I'm trying to recalibrate a little bit. Uh, but um, at this point, I'm, I'm confident that the, the Model X is really going to be a phenomenal car. Uh, when is it coming out? This summer. OK, so it'll for sure launch this summer? Yeah. OK. Yeah, for sure this summer. Um, and um, we, we do want to be cautious with the, with, with the Model X and make sure that, we, that we've done a lot of validation testing uh, to make sure, in particular, that the Falcon Wing door works perfectly in all, all circumstances. So it's like rain slows, slows sleet, hail, uh, on, a, you know, on a steep incline, 
in, you know, all sorts of crazy circumstances. Because the door is fundamentally different, no one's ever done sort of a double hinged gull wing or what, we, what we call a uh, falcon wing door. Falcon wing door. Um, and uh, we think it, adds, it, it, it it's sort of a fundamental step change in utility for an SUV. It gives an SUV more utility than a minivan. Um, and then because the because the center of mass is down low with the, the battery pack in the floor pan, it has a better center, of, a, a lower CG than any, it has like a CG of a sports car um, and the functionality of a minivan. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting, this car is really good. And I, I, I do not say these things lightly. I mean, I, I'm very self-critical of, of, of my own stuff, and I really think this is going to be something special. Earlier this week at the Detroit show, uh, Sergio Marchione said that there needs to be more consolidation in the industry, mainly to cut the cost of developing products. Uh, the problem in the car business is just the cost of investments and how much it takes to invest in a platform, as you well know. Yes. You've had discussions with BMW. Um, did Mercedes talk to you before it sold its Tesla stake? Yeah, actually, just a comment on the BMW stuff. That, 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 was, that was really sort of weird because the, you know, I, I happened to be in Germany uh, and I made an offhand comment to one of the German um, magazines because they asked me what am, I, what, what, was it, what, what am I doing in Germany besides getting this, the Golden Steering Wheel Award. Um, and I said, yeah, well, you know, BMW invited me to stop by and we talked about various things. Um, and that got blown up into, uh, you know, no. Elon, Musk, Elon, <laughs> Elon Musk announces giant partnership with BMW. <laughs> it's like, look, man, I was just passing through. Okay. Ian? <laughs> <laughs> he was passing through. I was just passing through. And, and then, um, so then the, media, the media sort of built up this massive story like, and, and, then, and then discovered that it wasn't true and then said, well, he lied about that thing. And I was like, ah, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just stick to Twitter. You'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... Are you, are you so, looking? So, I mean, we're, we're, we're happy to discuss partnerships with, with multiple companies. Obviously, we've done things with Daimler and with uh, Toyota. Are you looking at more partnerships right now? Um, we're, we're not actively seeking any partnerships because okay. our focus is so heavily on uh, uh, improving our production capability um, and, um, and, and then completing the Model X. So mm -hmm. we're, we're super focused on those two things. Um, and those, those are really hard because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to double our production capacity again year over year and get the Model X, which is a complicated new car with some things that have never been done before, to market and make sure it works well. So we're really just heads down focused on those two things as well as doing some of the pre pre preliminary work on the Model 3. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in any case, until the Gigafactory is up and running, there's just, we just don't have enough cells to, to do... Uh, deals with other car makers. But we're happy to have like preliminary talks that perhaps come to fruition in three years or something. So the Gigafactory, I mean, that's an enormous bet, right? Uh, yeah, yeah it, it is a huge bet, but I don't know of any other way to do it. Um, the, 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 the amount of batteries we need is so huge that somebody's got to build this thing. Um, and if we don't contribute a bunch of money to building it, I just don't see any other company doing that. Um, so, uh, you know, fortunately, Panasonic is, has been an awesome partner, and, and they're, they're making a, a significant contribution. But, I mean, just to get the whole thing to full capacity is something on the order of $5 billion. Right. Um, and uh, with, you know, Tesla, we're expecting to contribute uh, probably a little over $2 billion. Uh, Panasonic, maybe a little under $2 billion. Um, and then uh, various other uh, industrial partners making the precursor elements for the anode cathode and, and, and separator perhaps con contribute uh, five or six hundred million. Um, the, 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 the state of Nevada, uh, contrary to news reports, is actually only providing a very small amount of money in the beginning. Um, How much is that? A few hundred million. Okay. Uh, and, and that's in the form of land grants. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, there are all these, again, if I may complain about. Something I did write a blog piece about this. Um, the, uh, the the way it was portrayed by, by some of the media, uh, you know, in terms of the tax uh, abatements that Tesla got in Nevada, was that we were getting like 1.3 billion dollars. So they made it sound like the state of Nevada was like w wiring us a check for 1.3 billion dollars. <laughs> Nothing like that, remotely like that, has occurred. They're literally con contributing less than five percent of the of the the cost of creating the the, the Gigafactory, and then. 
And then all of the other incentives are basically uh, consist of not charging us like property and sales and use tax uh, on the vast amount of equipment that we're buying for the next sort of 10 to 20 years. Um, and, and in the, in the w most crazy situation where we, where we buy some enormous amount of equipment, um, over the course of 10, 20 years, that sort of use tax amounts to about a billion dollars, which is like 50 million a year. Right. But that's for a, for, for, for a factory that's outputting five to 10 billion dollars per year. So it's like 1%. It's, it's very tiny. Uh, people should not be under the impression that Nevada's paying for the factory. They're not. What if the gigafactory doesn't drive down battery costs like you think it will? It will, guaranteed. Guaranteed. Well, I mean, if it doesn't, like, I should definitely be fired. And, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Um, but So it's going to make all of this very scalable the way that you've described it when we, earlier in the conversation about the, the millions that you're going to get to. Yeah. Um, I mean... I think, I think the bar that we have to pass on the Gigafactory for the Model 3 is a 30% reduction on the pack cost. Because it being a smaller car, like the, the car needs to cost half as much. Um, uh, but, the, but the car is, is, is going to be about 20% smaller anyway. Uh, so, so that means to make it up... It to cost half as much as... As the Model S. As the Model S, okay. Yeah. So starting price of the Model S is 70K, so we're talking 35K. 30,000, right. Yeah. yeah, so 35K before any incentives. Um, and, uh, and, and so we have to make, to first approximation, everything about half costs about half as much. Um, so looking at the pack itself, because the car is, let's say, 20% lighter, it's going to require a 20% smaller battery pack. But, we, we need that, but in order to get to the 50% reduction, we need another 30 points. So the, the Gigafactory, by virtue of economies of scale, has to contribute that additional 30 points. Now, there are, we're not just doing economies of scale, we're also improving the fundamental technology uh, around the cell and the battery pack. Um, and, and I think if, if just based on, on economies of scale, because you know, we're talking about something that a factory that's, that would make as much lithium-ion batteries as the rest of all lithium-ion batteries in the world combined, of all types. Right. So if you take up lithium-ion batteries made for cars, laptops, cell phones, uh, and, and you sum up all those factories, uh, th that comes to a little over 30 gigawatt hours of production uh, at the cell level. We're talking about 35 gigawatt hours of production at the cell level and 50 gigawatt hours of production at the pack level. So we'll still be bringing cells in from other factories. Um, and um, I, I would say it's, I'm absolutely certain we can achieve a 30% cost reduction. Okay. I think it'll be, over time, better than 30%. By... Again, that 2020 time frame or beyond. Yeah. yeah. Your, your parts? High confidence, 30% by 2020, and with, with continued reductions after that. Okay. Your parts, your service model, uh, if you're talking about the scale that you're, that you're discussing here, needs to clearly evolve, right, in order to meet all of this demand for parts and service. What are you going to do there? Well, I guess we're going to hire a lot of people in service and... Get lots of parts. <laughs> but, you're, um, but you're going to need more than a van going to, you know, fix somebody's car, right? More, more than more than three guys in a van. Right, more than three guys in a van. Yeah. <laughs> so what? So what's the vision there? Um, well, we have lots of service centers, so we're we're adding. I mean, that's our biggest focus is, is service centers, uh, okay. much more than stores. Uh, so so we're. Um, Acquiring a lot of service centers and hiring a lot of people and, and building out that, that service infrastructure, um, and I think that, I think there's some ways that we can really innovate on service and, and do some really exciting things there, which we'll talk about later this year. Um, that really takes service to like a different different level. Um, You're talking about the quality of service, not the quantity so much. The qu the, qu the quality and how fast it happens. Okay, can you give us a hint? We'll make the announcement probably, probably in a month or two, uh, but I think it's 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 really, I think it has the potential to revolutionize service, you know, with, with some really innovative things, um, and um, you know I think service should feel like uh, invisible love, um, so it's just like the, 
when your car gets serviced, you don't even know that it was serviced. Like, it's just invisible. It just happened. Mm -hmm. um, and when it's done and your car's back, you love it. You feel the industry has that right now? No. Okay. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> uh, some say, you know, you represent yourself as an entrepreneur. You, you, you get government, yet you get government subsidies in various ways, whether it's the battery plant or the solar plant or your rocket company. Um, some say that subsidy level would put into question the whole, your whole nature of your businesses. So are you just the best ever at getting government money? No, I think, I think I'm quite terrible at getting government money, actually. Um, so if, if, you think, if you look at uh, Tesla and SpaceX and SolarCity, they got no government money at all in the first sort of uh, half decade of their existence. Nothing. Government wasn't doing anything. Um, and then to, I'll go through each, each one. In, in the case of Tesla, uh, as I mentioned, the first government money we got was a March of 2010 seven years after the company was started. Um, and, uh, and, and, that, and that money was specifically for Model, Model S development and for powertrain factory development. So we got $465 million, um, 365 of which was for the Model S, 100 for powertrain factory that could supply powertrains to other companies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but that, that was only paid, like we'd have to spend the money, show the receipts, get it ordered by Pricewaterhouse, and then be reimbursed a few months later. Um, that didn't help us with the roads to business, it didn't help us with anything else, and it only paid for a small portion of what, what Tesla needed. Um, the, the money that Tesla, Tesla needed and has spent has by far been generated in the private sector. Um, so at this point, we've generated, I think we've, we've raised four or five billion dollars in total, um, whereas the total, uh, whereas, whereas we had one government loan for 465 million dollars. Uh, this, this compares to loans that were vastly greater uh, to GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Vastly greater. Um, like 100 times greater. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, what's remarkable is that Tesla received so little government support, not that it received a lot. Um, and uh, do, do you uh, see a day when, the, when it will not, when Tesla will not, will be able to sell cars without government dependence? Well, we paid off our loan, by the way. We're the first to pay off our loan. And, uh, Just in, the, in terms of sales incentives? Well, there's the, there's the $7,500 tax credit, right. which applies to everyone. It's sure, the, sure it does. And yeah. It's there for any manufacturer. Uh, Absolutely. But, uh, so that's, uh, but can you sell without that? Yes, of course. Yeah. We, we, sell it, we don't just sell in the United States. No, understood. So, yeah, so, it, was, it was a U.S. question. Yeah. 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 Um, so we sell in, like, I don't know, 34 countries. Mm -hmm. Most of those countries have no incentives. So obviously, we're still selling cars. But what the incentive does is it's, it's a slight catalyst. Um, so if our car costs, you know, including options and everything, somewhere between eighty dollars and $100,000, um, and you get a $7,500 tax credit, OK, so you've got like about an 8% reduction in the car. That's helpful. Not a deciding factor. No, it, it's, it's not a deciding factor. It, it has a, it has a slightly, slight positive catalytic effect. Um, our sales would be slightly less if, you know, without that. Okay. That's all. Um, and then th there's, there are the zero emission vehicle credits, mm -hmm. um, which th those predate the whole um, CO2 things. I think people forget where the, the zero credits, which are, they're, they're, that applies to like about a third of the states in the country, but particularly California. The zero emission credits were put in place because the air quality was so terrible sure. in LA and the Bay Area uh, that people couldn't breathe and were getting, you know, that have like smog warnings and uh, people getting but you're selling emphysema now. and lung disease and everything. Yeah. So, but, but those ZEV, ZEV credits were because you have all, the, all, these toxic, all this toxic gas coming out of gasoline cars in close proximity to each other um, and hurting people's health. That's where the ZEV credits actually come from. Sure. Any manufacturer can, can acquire ZEV credits by making zero emission vehicles. So again, it's a level playing field. If we're able to sell zero emission credits, it's simply because some other manufacturer doesn't want to make zero emission vehicles. This is not some special handout for Tesla. It, this existed decades before Tesla. If, if, you know, and to those companies, I would say, hey, why don't you make zero emission vehicles? That's the way to not pay 
you know, not have to buy zero emission credit. Pure and simple. Are you, change the subject, are you a good boss? Um, I try to be a good boss most of the time. I mean, not, not all the time. Um, you know, the, You've lost a lot of talent in the last few years. Okay, that's false. So, uh, um, Correct. There, there was a completely asinine Wall Street Journal article that was written yesterday. You read that mm -hmm. piece? Okay. There was a mention uh, of this event in there, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, that, that article consisted of entirely, it was amazing that, to see an article consisting of statements, entirely of statements that are either obvious, wrong, or obviously wrong. Okay? <laughs> amazing. How did you manage to write an entire article? <laughs> And about a thousand on that category. Okay, um, but on the but the, the you you have lost talent though, right? Is there a company that exists that has not lost talent on Earth anywhere? Well, of course not, right? Every company there's attrition at every company. Mm -hmm. What matters is what's the longevity of of, of key executives and personnel at the, at, at the company. Uh, do, do they stay there a long time, or is there a lot of turnover? Um, do you feel your turnover rate's in the right place? Our turnover is less than industry average, not higher. That's why the article is so ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, they use the example of, uh, of, of like the Tesla general counsel, where they said, uh, yeah, Tesla had, had, like in the course of one year, three general counsels. That sounds like a lot, except whenever a, an executive position changes, in a, in a year, you have two, right? So all that means is the guy in the middle didn't work out. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. I mean, this isn't rocket okay, science, Okay, I'll, right? I'll, I'll take, you know, I'll take, okay, the middle guy in the middle didn't work out. Um, but I mean, Tesla's, Tesla's been around for 12 years. We've had three general counsels. That's an average of four years uh, per, per general counsel. Um, which is the standard sort of tenure for a general counsel. The average, average industry for a general counsel is about four years. Uh, and, and SpaceX, we've had, SpaceX is a year older, we were 13 years old, we've had one general counsel the entire time. So, so his tenure is now like 13 years. Um, so it, it would be, like if I had a problem with general counsels, you'd see that problem manifest itself at SpaceX as well as Tesla. Sure. Uh, but in fact, uh, the tenure at SpaceX is three times industry average, and at Tesla, it is exactly industry average. Okay. Um, you know, if, and, and I think with uh, you know, communications was another thing cited. The, the article wasn't even internally consistent because it says like, well, we had lots of turnover, uh, you know, and people implying that maybe people don't like working for me in the communications role. It's like, well, Ricardo Reyes just returned to Tesla to run right. Right. communications. I don't think somebody returns to a company if they hate it. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Your stock price. Um, it peaked at 289 uh, a share in September, and now it's at about two, 200, 202. Has that raised expectations for the company performance um, that, that may be difficult to meet? Uh, and, and what do you think of the wild fluctuation of your stock price? Do you, do you sometimes wish that it wasn't, uh, that it had not risen so high? Yeah, I think this is one of the downsides of being a public company is that you have people that are that are constantly speculating on the stock. Um, they're speculating on the upside, speculating on the downside. Um, I mean, you tweet and it moves 10%. Depends, yeah, not, not necessarily in the positive direction. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, so, you know, the, uh, and by the way, I should say, like, if, if I ever do do a tweet or a public announcement, it's, it's got nothing to do with the stock price. It's, but what, what what concerns me is I don't want customers thinking something that's wrong, okay? Sure. Uh, for for long-term investors in, the, in, in, in Tesla, the short-term fluctuations are not important. Um, and, you know, we, 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 cater, we cater our actions um, and our announcements to the long-term investors in Tesla. Those are the ones we really care about. The people that are in it just to speculate and then are out the next day, you know, we feel about them about the same way they feel about us. <laughs> <laughs> We don't care. <laughs> um, which brings me to marketing. Uh, right now, you don't buy any advertising. Um, with the sales volumes you just mentioned earlier. Well, you know, like I said, if, 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 since our, our challenge is building production rate, uh, we're production, if, if, we, we need to not be production constrained in order for, us to, if, for it to make sense for us to buy advertising. Right. Um, otherwise, we're just wasting money. I mean, we should take the money we spent advertising and just 
when invested in, in production capacity growth. Um, so I'm not, I'm not like super against advertising. I think at some point we will do advertising, but, but we just need to get, uh, get, get past this production limitation. Um, so that production limit, I mean, you've mentioned it a couple of times here. It's obviously a, a, an enormously key point in your mind. The production constraints, the, the, the limitations that you have, when do you see that easing and how is it going to ease? Well, we're working very hard to, to grow, grow the rates. I mean, as I said, our, our weekly production rate uh, year over year is, has increased 100%. For, for, a, for a manufacturer of a large complex object, that is a huge percentage growth. Um, and we're going to try to increase it again by 100% year over year in terms of the, the weekly production rate beginning of the start of the year to the end of the year. Next year. Yeah, so from beginning of this year to the end of next year, we want to try to double, double, it double our production production rate. Um, I don't know exactly where the uh, demand, where, where we start to, to have production exceed demand. Um, I, I, I don't think it's going to be this year, you know, because we've already sold out of all the Model Xs we could possibly make this year. But uh, for 15. For 15, yeah. Right. So just in advance orders for Model X. Um, if you order a Model X now, it arrives in 2016. Wow. Um, so That's a long wait for us. Yeah. So the, as, as many Model Xs as we can make this year, we will sell. So the challenge is not trying to generate more demand for the Model X. Like, we don't, we don't try to do that at all. Uh, our challenge is we just got to bring it into production, make sure it is a super great car, r reliable, and everything works well, and, that, and, and, then, and then ramp the production rate. That, that's our challenge. So I don't know, conceivably, advertising would, might make sense next year or the year thereafter, but I'd, it, I, so I'd it's not... difficult for, for me to predict when, when um, demand outgrows supply. So no Super Bowl in two weeks, okay. No. <laughs> um, you've become quite a mainstream culture celebrity. Is, is that help or is that a hindrance? I think it's a, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Um, it's gotten a lot harder for me to just like, you know, go have a drink at a Hang bar. Out. Yeah, it is. It's gotten like if I go to just like try to hang someplace with my friends, then people will come up to me uh, quite a lot, um, and uh, they're you know almost always really nice and everything. But but it is um, that's probably not what you expected in December of '08. No, no. I think December of '08 uh, that was when uh, yeah I was being accused of being you know. An idiot, a charlatan, uh, an idiot and a charlatan, um, like not even a good charlatan. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there, there were multiple bloggers keeping the Tesla death watch, like <laughs> like they were on day day five thousand of the death watch at this point. <laughs> um, so Tesla's going to work. Tesla's going to work. Yeah, it is working. I couldn't let you go without asking about space. Only four entities have ever launched a space capsule into orbit successfully and brought it back. The United States, China, Russia, and Musk. Well, we have a company, but yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. SpaceX. SpaceX, right. Um, are you... What have you learned from the space industry that you can apply to cars? Well... For rockets, mass optimization is extremely important. The like use of advanced materials and mass optimization is extremely important. If you, the, the, the requirement for mass optimization, say going from a car to a plane, is an order of magnitude, and then going from a plane to a rocket uh, is another order of magnitude in the importance of mass optimization. So that's why, for example, using uh, aluminum in the body and chassis was a no-brainer for me for the Model S, uh, even though people uh, had certainly had some internal battles on that front to, to make that happen. But for me, it was a very obvious choice. If you want to make the car light and have, still have amazing, an amazing crash rating and everything um, and uh, overcome the, the challenge of a heavy battery pack, you have to make the non-pack portion of the car light. So it had to be aluminum. Um, I think in the future, we'll be investigating some, um, at some advanced alloys that don't currently exist, um, and um, as well as bringing over some of the interesting alloys we have in the rocket industry. So I think in terms of, oh. of, of material choice, of um, advanced joining technologies, and, um, and, and, and setting up the geometry and constraints such that you can really create a mass-optimized vehicle, I think that's the most valuable thing. Are you going to travel to Mars in your lifetime? 
I hope so. Is that part of the plan? It depends on how long I live, of course, and, uh, and, and what progress they But you have like a 10 to 20 year horizon here where you want to, I mean, you want to go to Mars. I want to SpaceX. enable, I want to enable uh, large numbers of people in cargo to go to Mars. So it's not sort of about me personally wanting to make a journey back to Mars. I mean, that would be nice on a personal level, but I do think it is important um, that we as a species, as a civilization, are on a path to become a true space a true space faring civilization and a multi planet species. Um, I think that's a future that's exciting and inspiring. Um, that's the bright future. And the you know what we're trying to do with SpaceX is do what we can to help make that bright future true. You've got five boys. Do they like cars? You know, they're a little blase about the cars. <laughs> I try Do they to, like your cars? <laughs> yeah. Although I get, I get the critiques. Um, you know, I'll tell you one funny thing. When, um, when, when the, the Model S first came out, um, I intentionally deleted the uh, rear reading lights uh, in, in the back seat because I was like, yeah, people are just going to use, um, you know, Kindles and iPads and electronic readers. So they're like, why do you need a light in the back? Um, and then uh, one of my kids was trying to read his book in the back um, and said, this is the stupidest car in the world. I <laughs> Why was it? Like, how could you do this? It's like, okay, after that, we put the lights in the back. <laughs> uh, Have you ever talked to Warren Buffett? Um, yeah, we've had a few brief conversations. Uh, he's always a great guy to talk to. How about the car retail business? Um, no, we haven't talked about that. I did read that he made an investment on that front. I, I had a longer conversation, actually, with Charlie Munger before I, I was aware of the BYD thing um, back in, I don't think it was probably 2008 or 2009. Um, and uh, I was having lunch with him, and, and he was just, I mean, I, I'm a huge admirer of Charlie Munger, but, but he was just telling me all the ways that Tesla was going to fail. And it made me quite sad, actually. Um, <laughs> so... Um, but, but now, apparently, he, he thinks quite highly of, of, of Tesla and what we're doing. So. What would you want to see out of the... Uh, I mean, you're, you're in Detroit. You're, you're here during the biggest week of the year. What would your message be to the traditional automotive industry? I, I think the, the, the biggest message is just that I, I really would strongly recommend uh, making significant investments in electric cars. Um, and I, th I think... You're, you're, People won't regret making those decisions. Even at two dollars a gallon. Yes, absolutely. That doesn't hinder anything, does it? It it, it does reduce the economic forcing function to some degree. Um, the economic forcing function. Meaning high gasoline prices. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> I know. Uh, so, um, so there's there is some reduction, but you know, forty fifty dollars a gallon is still you know fairly, fairly high. Uh, uh, a barrel. Our barrel is still, right. still fairly fairly high. Um, and, um, and I think there will be increasing efforts by um, environmental groups and, and governments to place a price on carbon. Um, you know, obviously, that wouldn't just affect the price of carbon uh, for gasoline, but it would also affect it for electricity and everything. But, but an electric car is so much more efficient that it, even, even if all the electricity was generated by uh, hydrocarbons, it's still better to, uh, in terms of CO2 per mile to have an electric car. Um, so I think there's going to be huge uh, societal pressure towards electric cars. And I think they're just sort of fundamentally better. They're just, it's, it's just a fundamentally better architecture. Um, you can have very high torque. Um, the, you know, the, the efficiency of an electric motor can be upwards of you know, over 90% compared to a gasoline engine at more like 20%. Um, so... I think, and I think that's, that's where the future is going to go. Um, but it's only going to go there if the big car companies make risky decisions to do electric vehicles. Um, and uh, I, I hope they do. And as I said, we're, we're trying to be as helpful as we can be, um, which is sort of counterintuitive, because, like, why do we want all these competitors? Well, that's, that's the point. And you've seen some competitors come out this week, and it's, it is counterintuitive, but the way you describe it, the more the merrier. Well, the reason that I'm doing it, and certainly a lot of people at Tesla are doing it, is because we think it, it actually is going to make 
a difference to the world if we transition to sustainable transport sooner rather than later. Um, we're not doing this because we thought it was like a way to get rich or anything. Like, like I said, I, we thought, I thought maybe 10% chance of success at the beginning. I thought I'd just lose all my money. Um, and almost did, so it's not like it was, you know, that was, came very close to losing everything. Um, and um, I, I think we're really going to regret uh, the amount of carbon that we're putting in the oceans and atmosphere. I mean, we're really, um, really going to regret it. Great. Thank you very much for coming here today. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Elon Musk.